What's up, peers? I am Max Hillebrand, and I welcome you to join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. Today, I have an extra juicy and a bit long episode for you, uh, and that is with Chris Stewart and Nadav Cohen, two rock stars contributors over at the uh, Short Bits company. Uh, these guys have been building magical technology since 2015 in the Bitcoin space. Uh, and specifically, they were early pioneers of the Lightning Network, when, where they developed this paid API, an application interface where you pay for every API call that you make. Now, that was a very novel and very, very groundbreaking technology in the old days. But since then, they found something even more interesting and even more groundbreaking. And those are discrete log contracts and the Oracle systems that can be built with them. Uh, basically, this means unlimited smart contracts, uh, scalable and private, uh, because they happen off-chain in a trust-minimized environment. Uh, this has countless benefits over alternative smart contracting solutions, such as Ethereum or other shitcoins, um, because, well, they are on top of Bitcoin, and that brings countless improvements already. But we focus here specifically on the privacy benefits uh, that we can achieve once we have Taproot and Schnorr signatures in the Bitcoin protocol. And what that means for the Lightning Network privacy, for the discrete log privacy, and for all the beautiful things that we can build with this magic. So, Pierce, without any further ado, like and subscribe and enjoy this show. So I'm excited to finally get you both here on the line for the very first uh, three uh, threesome that we have here joined the Wasabi Cast. Uh, I'm very excited here to get Chris Stewart. Hello. Uh, hey. And Nadav Cohen, how are you? Doing well, how about you? Oh, fantastic, especially when talking to you. Uh, so I, I'm really, as, as always, first interested in what actually motivates you to write software in general uh, and uh, what were the compelling problems that you tried to solve in your, in your early uh, development career? Uh, what do you think, Chris? Uh, yeah, so I mean, my thesis generally on software is like, I, you know, I like to think of it in kind of like a historical context of like opportunity. And, uh, you know, we live, you know, in our generation, you know, software kind of gives us the most leverage possible to affect the most amount of people possible. Um, you know, you can distribute software extremely easily and uh, have millions or billions of people even using the, the thing that you wrote. Um, you know, say if we were to go back a hundred years and, you know, we were talking in 1920 instead of, uh, 2021, um, I probably would have been a mechanical engineer. I think, uh, you know, at that time, uh, you know, being a mechanical engineer, you're building all these sorts of new tools and automobiles, motorcycles, you know, military equipment. Uh, you know, you, you kind of had that same opportunity in that, uh, time frame. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's like really part of the motivation for me of writing software. It's, you know, it kind of is this intersection of, you know, you can make a living off of it. And you also have a lot of uh, influence and ability to uh, affect a bunch of people's lives with it. Ah, interesting. So kind of software as a force multiplier, right? You, you can do magical things with it. Uh, and the beauty of, of, you know, code is that you can share it basically at zero cost with as many people as you want, and that gives the technology that you're building on just that much more of an impact. Absolutely. Uh, how about your, Nadav? Uh, what, what were your uh, reasons? Yeah, uh, my motivations are maybe a little bit more academic. Uh, I have a background in math and theoretical CS, and specifically, I was doing some uh, programming languages kind of stuff in college. Uh, and so I... Oftentimes, especially with like, you know, DLCs, which we'll talk about and, and other things, I'm interested in like kind of just from a, a higher level view, like what can you do with this thing? Uh, and, you know, Bitcoin just kind of popped up uh, as, as an interesting, you know, system. And then, uh, you know, my mind usually goes to like, okay, what are, what is it that you can do with this system like how how far does it reach um and yeah i don't know it's just lots of interesting stuff i it, it fulfills some of the some of the math appetite while also 
uh, you know, being being hands on and you know, I just like building stuff, I guess. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, it's quite crazy, right? With, with cryptography, especially uh, the the magic that you can build with it. It's it's a bit counterintuitive and not really trivial to grasp at first. Uh, but but then you know, building and building on multiple layers with that really leads to quite interesting outcomes. Uh, very complex, but very useful. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people when they think about, you know, like contingent payments, uh, which most people call smart contracts, they they think about like code, when in reality, uh, the the scalable version of of contingent payments and and the version that you can, the only one you can build on Bitcoin really, uh, is much more complex than that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I want to upfront first get, get one more, uh, motivation for you on writing specifically free software, right? I mean, there's a huge market for proprietary closed source software, but, uh, when did you f- kind of fall in love with that free software development process? Uh, for, for me, I mean, the, the influence is Bitcoin really on its own is, uh, you know, it was released under this open source license. It's also, you know, money. And whenever you start dealing with money, and if you were distributing software to the masses, I think there's kind of an ethical um, obligation to make sure you have some sort of transparency there. Uh, I think, you know, of course, you know, you need to figure out a business model after some point in time, but uh, that can usually be built on top of free and open source software. You know, we've seen plenty of examples of this over the years now with uh, Linux uh, development and uh you know, all sorts of different software packages. You, like, you can go look at a bunch of messaging protocols that have developed over the years, you know, libraries that are designed for high frequency trading, which have, um, you know, roots in open source software. So it really gives you this kind of nice foundation that everybody else can base their business off of and build proprietary solutions off of this open source software. And it's again, not just a cryptocurrency that does this, a lot of other uh, highly technical industries do this, and you know the most prominent example being the Linux kernel at this point. I think. Yeah, and on top of that, I would say it, it also is really great for kind of like collaboration, uh, especially outside of the company. Because, um, like for example, with with uh, DLC specs and DLC code, we've got people working on on these things. From shared bits, from Crypto Garage, some independent developers like uh, Lloyd and Antoine and Jesse, and we just have like a bunch of people working on this one thing all at the same time. And really, it would be quite hard to do that without it being open source. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that happens when you get into this world is uh, the time zone problem ends up being a hard one. I like from the people that Nadav just mentioned there. You know, we've got uh, Eastern Asia. We've got Europe, we've got Americans, um, you know, Australians, Australians. I mean, satisfying that constraint is uh, pretty hard to do. And unfortunately, the European crowd, I think, is getting the short end of the stick. But um, you know, we're working to improve that. So, yeah, right. That's that's really a difficult thing. As soon as you go into this open source realm where anyone can contribute to the code, well, you cannot really have you know, a targeted contributor base just in one country because are you going to exclude people from a different region right just because they live somewhere else but if their code is good well you gotta merge it <laughs> totally yeah and i think at sure bits we we've kind of uh naturally gotten to a point where we have someone awake almost 24 7 from sure bits like i work uh kind of a split day where i also work while uh people in japan and australia are working and then Chris works super early in the morning, so we kind of we cover as much as we can. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, that's always interesting. And then uh, Max, going back to you know your point, it's uh, you know nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. Um, you know, there is no you know Americans have better ideas than you know people that live in Japan or whatever. And I think we've seen that play out with the discrete log contract protocol. You know, we've been really fortunate to have uh, contributors from all over the world at this point, and everybody always brings a unique perspective. And, uh, you know, usually it's thought of something we haven't uh, thought of ourselves, which is, is great to see. Yeah, right. That's that's one of the core realizations of free software, 
is that you're not going to figure it out by yourself, <laughs> right? Because this gets more and more complex, especially when you want to solve the important problems, right? Those are usually non-trivial to find solutions to. Uh, so you can need all the help that you can get. Right? And uh, if people flock in to, to brainstorm on how to solve the problem more efficiently, well, uh, that's the better for it. So you mentioned that time zones was one kind of constraint or limitation here. Uh, are there any other difficulties that you see in this type of collaboration? Um, I mean, I would say it's you know, nothing that's not um, the normal remote working uh, constraints. I think maybe uh, for the most... Oh, go ahead and it up. I was just going to say, sometimes there's uh, a little bit of the friction that comes with the more decentralized kind of team in, in the sense that, like, we don't have, like, a top-down, like, Chris says everyone is going to work on this one DLC-related thing and everyone does it, like, right, everyone is coming at it with their own, uh, you know, use cases and perspective and stuff. Which, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a bit longer to get code or uh, code and specification review on things. But uh, overall, I think it, it is still pretty, pretty dang smooth. And we have like monthly meetings and uh, to, to kind of sync everyone, get, get us all on the same page. And then on top of that, we're also just in, in constant communication and like DMs and on GitHub and stuff. Yeah, I think you really hit down on a, a quite substantial issue here or well it's both a feature and a bug uh that voluntarist aspect uh, that everyone just writes the code that he wants to well i mean that's that kind of leads to a spontaneous order but if you want to get a specific problem fixed as soon as reasonable right then then this might be a bit uh kind of a a, a boat without a captain um and that might actually be difficult especially if you add on top of that that often in free software there's no monetary incentive to keep building something and so that might lead to some negligence or just not really willingness to work that much. Well, I think the important thing there is like at the end of the day, even with free software, you need to be providing economic value. And if the thing you're working on isn't providing economic value to somebody, uh, you're, you're going to end up, uh, you know, having a hobby rather than, you know, maybe something that's more of a career. So, I mean, just like with, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about Bitcoin to start is, uh, you know, kind of had these parameters baked in so that uh, early adopters end up being wealthy too and hopefully end up, uh, you know, funding development in the future specifically for the use cases that they find valuable as, uh, you know, for their coins that they hodl. So um, it's, you know, Bitcoin kind of changed the game there. But uh, I, I do think, you know, even though software free doesn't mean that you, you know, don't, you aren't providing value to somebody. And if you aren't providing value to somebody, you're eventually going to, you know, run up against some constraints there with uh, funding. Yeah, yeah, right. That's that's a bit of a discrepancy here, right? The code is free and often gratis. But still, even for non-scarce free goods, they still have value. Right? People still use it and still, still spend time on it. So there's definitely something here. Uh, and I think we're we're just now with Bitcoin starting to discover more and more uh, ways of incentivizing this financially too. And on top of that, I feel like at least with the DLC specifications, we're starting to or, or we've reached a, a more critical mass than we had previously. Where now, if like you know one person disappears off the face of the earth, the entire project won't like be at a standstill. Um, or maybe, you know, a better example is like if someone is sick for a couple of weeks or something, then uh, we we can still, you know, move forward on the code and on the specification front. So that also helps uh, somewhat with kind of the, the more volunteer-ish nature of, of the kind of open source project is once it gets, you know, much larger, um, then you have fewer parts of it, which only one person really understands or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that's always a bit of an issue in early projects, right? If there's just one genius rockstar dev working on it, then he knows everything. Uh, and then contributors start coming in. Uh, you know, we see, for example, Satoshi. He was uh, probably the only one who understood the code base at first. And then how Finney looked at it uh, and, you know, contributed a bit here and there. And ever, then, ever since, the development community has grown and decentralized. And then, as you say, the, the bus factor, that one person gets hit by a bus, 
uh, the, the risk of that or, or the consequences of that um, get get reduced. Uh, that's that's for sure a very uh, valuable thing as well. Um, so, Chris, you uh, like you're the founder and CEO of, of one of the really uh, the, what can I say that like the the under the radar companies who actually get shit done. <laughs> <laughs> I've really appreciated that about shirt bits uh, for a long time. Uh, but can you maybe tell tell us a bit about how what you just said about free software and especially the financing of that, how that played a role in starting the Shirtbits company? Yeah, so I mean, Shirtbits first off didn't uh, start as a free software company, that's for sure. Um, my views have evolved over time on that, and as we've seen, you know, cryptocurrency adoption, we see that uh, you know you don't necessarily have to be profitable from day one like other traditional you know Silicon Valley companies. But you definitely still do need to make money at the end of the day. Um, you know, we've been beneficiaries of Bitcoin's price appreciation over the years and being able to fund ourselves that way. Um, but you know, that doesn't mean that's going to occur forever. And, uh, you definitely need to, you know, have a long-term sustainable business strategy. But, uh, the benefits of working in the cryptocurrency space is you do get that runway baked into the cake if you, uh, you know, opt into, you know, taking that path. And, you know, as of the time of this recording, you know, Bitcoin's doing very well. It's, you know, around $50,000, you know, per United States dollar. And, uh, but that isn't always the case, right? Um, you also can be at where we were at earlier this year, where Bitcoin was $4,000 per United States dollar. I guess early last year at this point, this is 2021, not 2020. But uh, in that regard, you kind of live and die by the sword. And also, you know, making long-term capital investments based on that is is tough. Um, you know, I'm a big-time Bitcoin believer, have been since uh, 2015, and have put my money uh, where my mouth is. But uh, it, it does come with uh, downsides, too. It's not all wine and roses, so to speak. So, you know, enter, enter with caution, I guess, is the long way to put that, uh, you know, there. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned that Shirtbits didn't start out as as this kind of free software Bitcoin company. Uh, so you were running Shirtbits for longer than you actually got Bitcoin. Oh uh, no 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 sorry. Uh, maybe I was a little unclear there. Uh, the initial funding Shirtbits took uh, back in 2015 was in Bitcoin. So uh, we had a venture capitalist Tim Draper who's pretty uh, famous in this space. Uh, he ended up purchasing like. 30,000 Bitcoin or something like that from a Silk Road auction in 2014. So uh, Ross Ulbricht uh, got arrested. The uh, DEA, I believe it was, seized a bunch of Bitcoins associated with the Silk Road. They had an auction to uh, resell those Bitcoins because the United States government didn't want to have them on their balance sheet. Uh, Tim Draper purchased these Bitcoins at said auction and then began reinvesting them into uh, the startup ecosystem in California. Uh, his son, Adam Draper, op operates a startup accelerator out of there, which I applied to. And the initial idea for Shirtbiz was an insurance company. Uh, I had just got done working at an insurance company prior to that. Uh, and then we pivoted since then and, you know, are in the DLC ecosystem and, you know, building that out. But uh, did, I, did I answer your question there, Max? Ah, uh, yes, yes. No, I understand that much better. Uh, thanks. That's interesting. Yeah, but you see, right? Once once you have your treasury in Bitcoin, <laughs> that really increases your your time horizon quite substantially, right? Your runway gets a lot longer. Well, again, it's uh, <laughs> it's a more complicated story than that. And you know, maybe come come talk to come talk to all these companies that have their Bitcoin treasuries when you know the Bitcoin price is down eighty percent from where it is now, because <laughs> Bitcoin has a tendency to do that, and. Uh, you know, I probably am getting a few white hairs on my head uh, from, you know, living through that two or three times now. So it, it, it's a trade-off and it comes with pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nadav, how did you actually then um, discover Bitcoin and ultimately found Shirtbits as a company? Yeah. So funny enough, that happened in the opposite direction. So um, I knew nothing about Bitcoin. Um, and I, uh, was about to graduate, uh, from, from the university. And I met Chris through, uh, the, my research advisor, uh, who I was doing this, uh, programming language research with. Um, 
he introduced me to Chris because I also, we went to the same uh, undergraduate university at the University of Iowa. And so, uh, he, he put me in touch with Chris, a former student of his, and, uh, we essentially, uh, chatted at like a coffee house in, in Iowa City. Um, and yeah, I, I ended up, uh, joining Shirtbits and then learning what Bitcoin was after the fact. Um, normally on, on podcasts, I speculate as, as to why Chris took Cedrus, but since he's here, we could just ask him. <laughs> I mean, if, if anybody in the Bitcoin space can't tell, uh, you know, Nadav is extremely bright and it's very easy to work with him too. So when you put those two things together, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, He's a net. He's a net ad to pretty much every aspect. So <laughs> it's a pretty easy choice for me, I guess. Yeah. So after I after I joined uh, Shared Bits, I was I was I guess at the time I was just looking for any software engineering job that would let me uh, work remotely. Uh, not at first, even I, I was working in person at Shared Bits at first, and then later working remotely. But uh, yeah, so I, I didn't know anything about Bitcoin. I like skimmed the white paper the night before I met Chris um, for, for an interview. And uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I learned the, the programming language we use and how Bitcoin works and all the rest of it just kind of in my, in my starting months. Uh, I, I guess I, I formally learned how Bitcoin works and what it is by implementing the Bitcoin D RPC client and Bitcoin S. Um, which was a massive project, but um, yeah, that, that's how I learned what Bitcoin was, and then moved on from there, I guess. Oh, that's really interesting uh, because in last episode of Join the Was a Beat, or not the episode before episode three, um, uh, Nicolas Doyer actually said that he, when he discovered Bitcoin, his way to learn it was to take the tests framework of the Bitcoin Core implementation and the Bitcoin J library. Uh, and copy the tests and port them to C sharp and then write new C sharp code, uh, to make the tests, uh, success or succeed. Uh, and, and that way, similar to you, uh, actually have that hands on experience with the code. Uh, what, what do you think about that approach in hindsight? Uh, is it, is it useful? Yes, but I will say it was really helpful for me to like, I was sitting like right next to Chris, uh, in, in this shared co-working space and i was I, I think for the first couple weeks like he got no work done other than answering my non-stop questions um but so long as you have some way of figuring kind of the, those kinds of things out because i was i was really starting from like zero so maybe if you if you, if i knew a bit more then this would have been much better like if i was going say from a, a less technical understanding to a more technical understanding then uh, i think that's a, a pretty good approach um, but as I was coming in with no knowledge whatsoever, uh, it, it was really imperative that I could like turn to the person next to me and be like, Chris, what is a transaction? <laughs> and then he can like try and explain that. But it, it does have the benefit of like, uh, so uh, the, the Bitcoin DRPC client is essentially just all the commands that you can ask the, the Bitcoin core code to, to do something with. So say like get new address, uh, send to address, uh, get raw transaction, these kinds of like things. Uh, and then I was implementing this in Scala. So I essentially just needed to understand like one thing at a time. Like I didn't have to understand the whole of how Bitcoin works to understand how, like, uh, what, what it means to say sign a transaction, which is just one command. And then I needed to figure out like what the type signature is for that method. Like, uh, what are the inputs? What are the outputs? And what are their types? And then find that stuff in the Bitcoin S code base. And so that's also kind of how I started to learn the code base as well. Um, yeah, but I, it, it went, uh, I, I think it was a pretty good way for, for me to learn these things. But I will note that like I, I asked questions nonstop for a couple of weeks, um, and had someone there to answer those. Yeah, I, I do think that this is quite essential right, to be able to have a conversation and ask all these questions and probably ask them a couple times right, before you really grok the whole picture. Uh, so, Chris, that was for sure a big time investment, but was it worth for you? Well, I mean, the doc's still sitting here, so 
Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, come on, like, Nadav is also, you know, I would consider one of the, the lead architects, probably with uh, Thibaut over in Crypto Garage of the DLC protocol. So, I mean, I, I don't know who understands Bitcoin better at this point at a technical level if it's me or him. So, um, you know, yeah, I, 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 yes, yes, unequivocally, yes. <laughs> nice. That's a good compliment. Yes, uh, and you know, also, Nadav, for you, I mean, you know, coming to the job market new, having uh, your education and uh, wanting to, to earn some money, but for you also, this was quite a substantial risk, right, to to jump cold feet into the Bitcoin rabbit hole and go to a Bitcoin company already. Um, what was kind of your, your thinking here? Why did you take that risk? Yeah, I guess, um, so my my only other real software engineering experience uh, other than like personal projects and school stuff uh, was I uh, did an internship with Google uh, while I was in college. Uh, and I guess when I was looking around at like what I wanted to do, at least for the next couple of years, I was kind of like, like I, I, I wouldn't necessarily not consider working at like a big tech company. But I, I remember, like, it was a really fun time to work at Google. Like, the perks are great, the food's great, all the rest of it. But the actual, like, coding work itself was a little bit unexciting and slow and, and all the rest of the things you might uh, expect from, from, you know, working at a, a very giant company that is, you know, pretty... Uh, or at least, you know, most of its projects are pretty uh, conservative in the sense that, like, you know, you you take a lot of time to do ev everything, you know, make sure that there are no problems anywhere. And uh, I, I guess, y yeah, I, I'm rambling at this point, but I, I was it, I found the the proposition of of working at a, a really small uh, startup, uh, you know exciting and and you know these days like i i have a lot of agency over like what it is i i'm working on you know i found dlc's interesting and so uh i i think how this came about is me and chris were at a des moines blockchain meetup that i was invited to speak at and then i was just talking about all the different ways to take smart contracts off chain and how that would apply to bitcoin and then uh, everyone ended up just, uh, you know, we didn't get past DLCs because everyone just spent the rest of my talk uh, essentially doing a and a about them. And so then we eventually ended up kind of pursuing them also like at work. And so I, I guess I, it's just really attractive to me how how fast we move and how we get to work on all the cool and interesting things uh, kind of closer to the cutting edge. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I guess in my mind, I probably was thinking like, I have a math CS double major. If, if this doesn't work out and, and we end up with like no money, maybe I'll just like, I don't know. I, I, I felt comfortable going and, and then maybe doing something else later. So it felt like the right time to, to take a risk uh, was, was right out of college. And I guess it did help. I wasn't coming out of college with debt because I, I was able to... Um, Go, go to college on, on scholarships and I stayed in state and all the rest of it. So I, I kind of, I had a, a clean slate as opposed to like some debt that I needed to make sure to get rid of. Yeah. That's, that's such an important aspect right? that's, that you can, that you can have the courage to take the risks and not have the huge debt burden hanging over you. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so I was wondering because by now shirt bits kind of seems to be focusing a lot on discrete block contracts and then this Oracle magic. But that was not the shirt bits that I got to know at first, um, because, you know, back in the days, you were a pioneering Lightning Network uh, adoption. Uh, I remember opening the first uh, one of my early channels to you back when Mainnet was way, way still too reckless. <laughs> but uh, can you tell me a bit about why you got so interested in the Lightning Network at first? Yeah, I mean, so just to put it in some like historical context, uh, you know, this was 2018. We are just coming off of the latest bull run. Um, network congestion was something that was very much at the forefront of everybody's thoughts. And we thought, uh, you know, Lightning Network was going to really gain traction really quickly because everybody understood 
um, that blockchains kind of suck. Like blockchains are really good for a very small set of things. And everything outside of that, you need to kind of, you know, build solutions around the blockchain or on top of the blockchain. Um, so, you know, we thought, okay, we're going to have this tailwind of the Lightning Network behind us. People are going to be looking at new ways to make money with crypto. Well, a way to do this is by selling, you know, API calls for Bitcoin. And uh, unfortunately, that uh, didn't, you know, that thesis didn't end up playing out, um, you know, Lightning unfortunately kind of stagnated for the next couple of years and uh, you know we still are waiting for i'd say broad-based cryptocurrency adoption um ironically you know as again at the time we're recording this podcast we're starting to see these congestion problems heat up again so maybe we'll see some you know big exchanges keep integrating lightning and you know they have been the last couple uh months uh i think uh you know once the exchanges adopt lightning uh, it's going to be Kind of downhill from there, but uh, unfortunately, during that uh, two or three year time frame, there uh, we didn't see that kind of broad based adoption, and unfortunately, weren't able to you know, get adoption for the product uh, of API calls for Lightning as well. So uh, that's at least how it played out in from my eyes. Uh, interesting, because I I love that use case and that model of a paper API call with Lightning. I mean, that's just that's so cool. Um, but, but why do you think did this project struggle? Was it just because of the lack of user adoption for people who to actually pay with Lightning? Well, I mean, there's there's a couple of cuts on it, right? So there's the first cut is you know people don't want Lightning, which may be the case. I mean, we you know we are still we're seeing adoption. It's always tough to put this into context because you know things are changing as of the recording of this podcast. I think um, so. But from my eyes, what we saw from the time frame of 2018 to 2020 is, uh, you know, exchanges weren't clamoring to adopt Lightning because there wasn't fee pressure. Customers weren't demanding it. And uh, thus, they got prioritized. Lightning integration got prioritized lower than adding the new uh, coin that they can generate revenue off of. Um, now that, you know, this is kind of changing, in my opinion, like we're seeing more fee demand. Uh, which is going to propel the adoption of Lightning, in my opinion. Uh, maybe if we were to start the same business uh, today, we would have much more success at it. But if people aren't adopting the technology that you are uh, predicating the business model off of, you know, it's it's going to be a tough, tough uh, road to you know be a successful, profitable business. The other cut on it is, you know, maybe we just weren't selling the appropriate data sets and uh, the data that we were, you know, serving wasn't as valuable as, uh, you know, what customers would have demanded. And uh, maybe that is also the case. And, you know, then we just need to look internally a little bit more there and uh, figure out what to do correctly. So, I mean, I, in my opinion, it could be either of them. Uh, funnily enough, even with the stuff that we're working on currently, uh, you know, I think the API calls for lightning payments, you know, works in the discrete log contract model too with oracles. But, uh, you know, we'll have to see if that's, uh, if that's what the market wants is, you know, selling these things for, uh, you know, payments of Bitcoin or oracle signatures for payments of Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, we're also seeing like, you know, various companies have products that are kind of similar to this. Um, Bizarre, which is a product that Bitfinex has, uh, is, very similar to kind of the model that we were taking as well. So, I mean, I, I also don't think the, I don't know if the model has failed per se. It's just, it, we may have been too early is, you know, the kind of takeaway, I think. So, you know, I don't know if I want to discourage other people from trying it because maybe if we see broad based lightning adoption, this business model will work. Um, but until we see this broad based lightning adoption, it's very tough to, uh, gets the network effect, the customers, the all, all of these you know little things that go into making a successful business align so that uh, you can be successful at the end of the day. So um, I don't know, maybe I'm rambling here now too, but hopefully there was some insight in there that you can glean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think that aspect of being too early might be a big part of it because I mean, Lightning still to this day is, is nascent and tiny. And so, uh, and think about uh, two years back or even three, 
<laughs> there was nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, this industry is like it, it's very fast. It moves very fast, but very slow at the same time. It's like <laughs> it's like a mind game with uh, you know time, I guess. And I don't know, Nadav, do you have anything else to add to I guess this, or do you think uh, that's pretty much accurate? Or yeah, I, I think that that sounded about right. Um, and, and to your point about it being like fast and slow, I feel like it's if you're trying to follow like all of the new developments, like you will drown. But if if you like just zoom out and follow like the the much bigger bigger like level things, like you know when when are when PTLCs or when Taproot or th- these kinds of things, then it seems like nothing's happening quickly and everything's taking forever. So it's kind of yeah, it's that weird paradox there. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm excited for for Lightning to continue to advance both in adoption and in development. I think there's a lot of cool stuff in the pipeline that will make Lightning much more ready than it was a couple of years ago for um, kind of you know mass adoption and and just like a much higher uh, you know a much larger group of people to to be able to use it smoothly. Um, so if I recall it correctly, the way that your paper API call thing worked is that uh, you had the data set that was sent via uh, through the API, but it was encrypted. Um, and so the user could get the encrypted data file and then pay a Lightning Network invoice, and the hash pre-image of that was the decryption key. Uh, is, is that an accurate summary of how it was? Yep, and we called it uh, PAID, all caps, for Payment Atomic Information Decryption. as a PAID <laughs> API. Yeah, I mean, I think Nadav came up with that, and I thought that was very clever. Um, I, I still hold out hope that, uh, you know, that at least the acronym, I mean, come on, guys, even if the underlying technology changes a little bit, like, Payment Atomic Information Decryption, like the PAID API, like, I, I just think it's a... So easy to market, but uh, I digress. Yeah, I think I think these days uh, the the tech people use for for these kinds of things. I could be mistaken, but I believe uh, LSAT over uh, at, on on like LND, for example, is a way of doing a very similar kind of thing. Um, but yeah, would you rather get paid or would you rather go take an exam? Like you know, uh, the LSAT is is the uh, law <laughs> exam that you take. So, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens there. But yeah, that, that's the idea is, um, you, you encrypt the data, give it to them, and then once they have that, they can, uh, pay the invoice and then they can know that they, uh, essentially get the data atomically with their, with their payment. Um, you know, if, if the server went down after they, their payment went through, but they hadn't gotten their data yet, uh, it is kind of like a situation that you don't have to worry about, for example, uh, when you do things this way. Um, yeah, and then in, in the future, when we have PTLCs instead of HTLCs on Lightning, another upgrade to the Lightning Network coming in the future, um, we'll be able to sell certain kinds of data in this way uh, in an actual, like, more trustless setting. So, like, for example, if you are selling a signature, like a Schnorr signature, like an Oracle signature, um, you can actually do this over the lightning, over a PTLC based lightning network in a way where, um, you can make the signature itself the payment pre-image. And, um, you can do it in a way that, like, the payer can validate that that is what the payment pre-image is from the, uh, hash, so to speak, like without uh, being given any extra information. They can just know that, like, this payment will go through if and only if I receive a valid signature of this message from this oracle. Uh, and they can, they can have that scheme set up without anything fancy, just using, like, normal PTLC-based lightning model. That's actually interesting, uh, because as I was writing part of my bachelor thesis about, like, your short bits API uh, case, my professor brought exactly this up uh, in, in like the review process. He's like, well, that's interesting, but how do you know that the encrypted package that you received is you can actually decrypt after you got the payment? And so that seems to be one uh, quite substantial 
uh, like flaw in the old design uh, that we could improve with Taproot and DLCs. Yeah, and I mean, I think to a certain extent, oftentimes it's not really a problem because you're trusting the data provider in some sense already. But uh, it certainly is much nicer, especially for things like digital signatures, where you could imagine like a pay for digital signature uh, building block in some larger crypto system being being a useful thing where you don't want to trust, uh, you know, the, the provider of the signature. Um, and yeah, yeah. So I, I guess at a high level, it is theoretically possible to do this kind of thing with HTLCs with hashes, but they require some pretty gnarly zero knowledge proofs to be added to the system. Whereas, uh, yeah, with, with PTLCs, essentially, it makes uh, all the zero knowledge proofs much, much easier and simpler. And in the case of selling signatures, it's essentially trivial. Like you just look at the point, and that is, uh, you, you do some quick validation, and there's not really much to it in terms of. Uh, no, like validating the data before you get it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one of the other kind of issues with the initial design maybe was that um, the hash pre-image was kind of the key for everything, right? But in the current design of Lightning Network, not only the payee receives that, um, but every person in the route. Right, so uh, can you maybe rephrase this problem and if you stumbled upon it previously and again, how DLCs or how Taproot will solve that? Yeah, so the un, under kind of the current HTLC-based Lightning Network, uh, everyone along a given route learns the payment pre-image. Um, and so when we were doing kind of paid stuff, or at least uh, when we were talking about how it should be specified, um, essentially, you have to add like an extra thing, like you need the payer's uh, uh, a pub key that the payer knows the private key to, for example, uh, to use in the encryption alongside the payment preimage, uh, in order to make it the case that only the payer like gets the thing that they need. Um, it was and, it implemented in the early short bits? I don't. No, and I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, I get in some sense it was. Uh, so we didn't actually have to do anything because we were using. Uh, uh, we I, I think we had a, a WebSocket based API uh, that was using WSS. So it's like HTTPS. It's that that last S is for uh, essentially it's um we the, the transport layer ensured that. Uh, when we were sending them things that uh, it was encrypted with like a pub key that they uh, were using. And so kind of because they got this data from us previously in a way that only they could, you know, it can't be eavesdrop eavesdropped on. Um, that is kind of, that, that covered our bases for, for that use case. But um, yeah, if you're not using uh, a more, like if you were, if we were just using like HTTP or something, we would need to take extra steps. Or if we were doing something in a P two P setting as well, there would be extra steps that would have needed to be taken. But I think our bases on this front were covered just because of, um, WSS uh, and uh, HTTPS. Uh, so that kind of covered our bases in the background, so to speak. But yeah, I mean, I think generally speaking, uh, it, it 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 will be nice in the future when not every person along the route learns the same secret, and rather um, the payer learns a unique secret, which uh, is coming with the PTLC upgrade. Mm -hmm. I was also wondering, because currently, I, I mean, even still to this day, Lightning Network payments are very fickle, and most of them don't go through, uh, especially when you consider longer routes. Um, was that an issue with with you in the past, uh, like that that payments failed uh, all over the time, and that that added more complexity? Well, yeah, I mean that was part of the issues. I wouldn't say that's like the primary issue, but I mean that was an issue as well. You know, like if you start like talking about compounding issues now, it's like um, so you need to have this new technology. You have to make sure you have you know a well connected routing graph, and when people are um, you know, beginning to learn about the technology, that, that that's a pretty hard thing to maintain. 
especially when the uh, network itself was in its infancy. Um, you know, a lot of kind of work has gone in over the years to improve this story. And, uh, you know, I think, especially as we see trading, like pick up on lightning, it's going to become a lot less of an issue. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a, a factor, I guess. Mm-hmm. I see. I see. Are there any major learnings that you made along that path uh, of implementing these paid APIs? Uh, anything that you would consider redoing it when you have the chance? Um, I don't. I mean, yes, there is learnings, of course. There's like, uh, you know, it's always hard to get new technology adopted and, you know, just you, you may not be wrong, but you may be too early and like, you know, finding that line in the sand is always a tricky one, I guess. Um, I, I think in the, the technical realm, I, I still feel just as confident in all of the stuff that uh, we built as I did on day one. I mean, I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking of any like technical thing that uh, you know, I don't still have confidence in. But you know, that's not the you know, only part of the story when you're looking to build a business, right? You know, you need your customers to align. You need to make sure you market yourself well, uh, sales, you know, all that stuff is uh, much more complex when you're in a new ecosystem, especially when you're going against uh, certain tailwinds. Like one of the great things about the crypto space is, or maybe the bad things about the crypto space is it's very uh, seasonal, I guess is probably what you'd say also. It's like, you know, as the Bitcoin price goes up, you have this massive uh, influx of interest into all these new technologies. You get a ton of very small, smart people that come along and look into this stuff. But then, you know, as price goes down, you know, the interest wanes and you're left with, uh, I guess, the, the hardened veterans such as ourselves to, you know, kind of advocate for this technology. So, you know, we're in a very exciting time right now because number go up, of course, and, uh, you know, you get to spread a lot of uh, information and show people how cool this technology can be. Uh, you know, and you'll get the next uh, round of hardened veterans for uh, you know, the next bear market. So, um, you know, I, I guess it's just part of the, the ecosystem you've got to understand and deal with and uh, be ready to go when it is go time. I would say, though, that uh, probably everyone at Shirtbits learned a lot about the Lightning Network and how it works, and we just have a lot more kind of technical proficiency in, in lightning and, and things like that. Uh, which, and, yeah, and I guess especially just me personally, like I came in not knowing anything about the lightning network at first. I was working on this uh, paid API stuff just from a high level, like Eclair has like, you know, an interface where you, you ask, like I understood that there was a payment pre-image. I didn't understand how lightning channels worked or anything like that. Um, but then, you know, uh, I think after listening to a Christian Decker talk about like, uh, channel update mechanisms and L2 and stuff at, uh, Lightning Hack Day in New York, I just like went head first into reading all the bolts. And I think we had like bi-weekly, like we, we read, we all, uh, went through one bolt every other week. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like it was a, a great learning experience internally at Shirtbits to, to go through that. And we also ended up turning out a bunch of content about like a high reliability lightning nodes in the future, private key management, uh, kind of all, all those kinds of things, just churning out all the things we were learning, uh, in our blog as we went. Oh yeah, for sure. The, the Shirtbits blog was one of my most recommended blogs uh, for anything lightning network related. I, it, it really, really advanced content there. Um, so, so kudos for writing that. Um, you know, actually, what, what was the motivation for writing such a blog? I mean, it takes a lot of time. Uh, I mean, I think uh, it's really good marketing material at the end of the day. It's like you, I mean, it's kind of killing two birds with one stone, right? It's first off conveying the technical information, which is important. And also, it makes us make sure we understand it when we have to regurgitate it in a way that... Uh, is consumable by other folks, but also it really helps build your you know technical brand. Is you know other people like such as yourself come to the site, they're like, oh yeah, what are they writing about? And obviously they understand the stuff, like or else they wouldn't be able to write about it. And it's it's a good way to yeah build a, a company brand, in my opinion. 
that can go either way. Yeah, and as a as a not very business person, I just enjoyed learning a new thing every week. <laughs> like that, that I mean, yeah, it, it usually, like there was at some point, at, uh, at maybe a, a year ago, maybe a bit more than that, where uh, I was. Like I, the blog was like a twenty percent project for me. Where like one day out of the week, I would just like go heads down on on a new thing and um, turn out a, a blog post out of that. Sometimes more than one, but uh, it, it it has slowed down a little bit uh, for me just because you know now we're we're very focused on uh, DLCs and you know we write new things as as they pop out of, of DLC stuff. But I feel like. I'm I'm learning a lot of the stuff I'm learning these days is not so much like ooh how does that work it's like this very very low deep down in the weeds thing of like how do we make this specific DLC like thing work which is maybe not as uh, great for a general audience as like what's a Schnorr signature or something like that um, but yeah I don't know I, I feel like yeah, ha- having kind of this this blog as a responsibility is also just great for uh, making sure everyone is always like learning stuff internally. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm still very curious about that point where you realized that the Lightning Network Gate API is not going to work out, at least not for now. Um, like, when was that point, and did you then already have the discrete log contract oracles as kind of the backup plan, or did that evolve afterwards? Well, I mean, I would say the, the pivot that was kind of done in motion, you know, and the dog really started getting interested in this DLC stuff. And we got paired up with the Crypto Garage guys over in Japan who were, I mean, to give them, you know, a shout out, they have been working on DLC stuff since, uh, mid 2019, maybe even early 2019. They executed a forward contract, uh, with DLCs with Blockstream around that time frame. And uh, I forget who introed us to them, but, you know, we got to talking with them. They seemed serious and, you know, wanted to make sure this technology was adopted. And, you know, we at the time were, you know, writing a lot of blog posts and had this technical expertise to be able to execute on this as well. And it seemed like something that people were interested in. So um, giving it a shot, uh, it seemed worthwhile. And also we were seeing you know, the Ethereum DeFi craze and uh, that you know, kind of goes to show there is a market for this stuff. We just have to make it, uh, you know, work with Bitcoin and, you know, figure out how to best package that up with the tools we have available to us in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Yeah, and I think we also, like, at, at the time where I was starting to work on DLCs, was essentially, like, most of the work to set up the paid APIs had been done. Like, you know, we'd added all of the major trading pairs on all of the major exchanges as API data. And there there just wasn't too much more to pursue from like just a like development, uh, you know, point of view, like, you know, the, the thing was built uh, and, you know, sh- surely it wasn't a perfect thing, but um, yeah, it, it was like, there wasn't more that needed to happen before it had a, a shot at adoption. And so, uh, even just regardless of whether or not it was working, I think um, a lot of the development time at Shirtbits started uh, going towards other things uh, like discrete log contracts and uh, some wallet stuff and, and various other things um, at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, Nadav, you spoke earlier about the concept of smart contracts unchained. Uh, so explain, please, what's the difference between having these smart contracts, these conditional payments, completely on-chain and completely off-chain? What's the fundamental difference? Um, well, the on-chain version is not scalable <laughs> or private, and the off-chain version is, uh, but it's harder, I guess, is the trade-off. Um, you know, it's it's relatively simple to go, you know, code up some new solidity contract and and have it run on ethereum or something uh, and it's it's significantly more involved to build a version of that that scales and is private and uh, executes using you know some off-chain cryptography and state uh, between peers um but Why i guess that scalability oh, but... and privacy is so intertwined here 
Yeah, I mean, essentially, it's because the the scaling bottleneck we're talking about is the blockchain, and with the blockchain, um, it having something on chain. So, so block space is a scarce thing. Like the 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 fee market is a market for block space in some sense, and um, yeah. So essentially, the on chain version of contingent payments means that. Uh, you're going to run into scaling issues because you're using a scarce thing to to execute your contingent payment um, in in a much more heavy duty way than just like a normal payment, um, which is what it, it, it's built for or useful for. And uh, then on top of that, be, like the scarce thing you're using also happens to be public, so it's kind of the the scalable thing also happens to be the private thing because. Uh, it, it's not using a blockchain essentially, and because because blockchains are terrible for many things and good for a couple things. Um, yeah, so I think oftentimes in the quote unquote blockchain space, like private things tend to be more scalable than not private things, which is nice. Yeah, that's that's actually very nice. Right, we see something similar with the Lightning Network. It's more scalable. It increases the transaction throughput, and yeah. it's well arguably more private <laughs> at least it has the potential to be more private mm -hmm. and and that's a really really nice combination right so yeah and it's 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 precisely because you're not using a blockchain <laughs> for for a lot for most of the activity that happens on on the lightning network happens not on a blockchain which makes it scalable and private um whereas using a blockchain is oftentimes uh not scalable and not private um so yeah. what is the blockchain then actually used for? Uh, the blockchain is great as a settlement consensus layer. So like you want uh, to transfer value and you want that transfer of value to be final and irreversible. Um, then, you know, it's great for that. Um, it's it's not good for state machines. You, you can't put a state machine on a blockchain and expect it to scale. Um, you'll either end up you know, going the quote unquote like big blocks, you know, or more trans, more, more blocks or bigger blocks or whatever it is that, uh, you, approach you want to take where you, um, end up making it impossible for normal people to run nodes. Um, right? Like you can't run an Ethereum node on a normal laptop probably these days. Uh, you'll have trouble syncing it, staying up to date with it. Uh, everyone in, that space uses light clients. No one actually runs a full node. Um, so that's a huge issue there. And then, uh, yeah, I guess in, in contrast, if you accept the fact that block space is scarce and just use it only for the bare minimum that it's good for, which is a uh, final settlement, um, and especially in cases of dispute, like if, if people aren't, if people don't have disputes, even if they're not uh, trusting each other, like it's an untrusted counterparty setting. But if everyone is being cooperative, there really is no reason to use a blockchain. It's like going to the grocery store with a tank and demanding that they sell you groceries. Like they want to sell you groceries. Like mo most people who are interacting financially are, are doing so in a cooperative fashion. Like, very few people, proportionally speaking, have to go to court because their grocery store is trying to scam them. Um, and, and that's really what Bitcoin is, is good for is it's, it's good as like a settlement layer, kind of as an, as an analogy. A lot of people like to think of it as like the, the court system. Like, you know, most things are settled out. Most things don't need to even need, need any kind of arbitration. It's just all cooperative. And then beyond that, even the things that, uh, are disputed oftentimes don't need to go to court, right? You you can use some some third party arbitration of some kind, um, which the analogy here is like you can use escrow contracts or you can use uh, oracle contracts or something like that. There are very very few cases proportionally that need to go to the blockchain, and so really you should only be using the blockchain for kind of this this bare minimum. Um, of, of what you need to, where uh, some value needs to be transferred, um, and you can't do it uh, without going to the blockchain. 
so yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, the, the Bitcoin approach is, is in some sense, like the small blocks approach, right? Like we just accept that block space is scarce and, um, also realize that like you don't need block space for most of what people are using it for these days. Um, you really only need block space for a very small set of things. Mm -hmm. So let's get a bit more specific about the, the block space usage, um, specifically for Lightning Network. Uh, and here again, we'll focus on the privacy. Um, so, you know, at first there is the uh, Lightning Network channel opening. Um, which, which is where one or even multiple users, uh, put, uh, or send Bitcoin to an, to an address. Um, so at, at this step, kind of what is publicly revealed uh, about this financial transaction? Yeah. So when you open a lightning channel, um, these days it is single funded. In the future, we'll also have dual funded lightning channels where both parties are putting up money. It's not just, uh, starting. Uh, kind of with all of the money on one side of the channel. Um, that's a, a work in progress, and I think Sea Lightning might already have that, but I, I could be wrong. Anyway, um, the thing that uh, you can discover by looking on chain is you can see that someone has put funds into a two of two multi sig. Um, that is something of a footprint. A lot of two of two multi sigs are Lightning channels these days, uh, but. I guess it's important to note once we have taproot, two of two multi-sig looks like a single pub key. So you will just see nothing. Like you'll see normal transaction activity on chain for a channel opening. Um, that said, uh, it is probably important to keep in mind that if you're opening a public lightning channel, then you're also gossiping about it to everyone on the lightning network. So, um, you know, if you want a public channel, you also just tell everyone about it. So everyone can see that that's what happens there. But um, if, if you don't want to do that, uh, you know, in theory, opening a Lightning channel uh, just means putting funds into a two of two multi sig on chain, which in the future will look like a single pub. Yeah, I think uh, that that hones down to the point, right? Where in, in Lightning Network, you you might even be able to obfuscate the on chain footprint, right? Uh, if you go a bit further with something advanced like uh, Taproot and multi uh, uh, music and so on. Yeah, it might be difficult to actually find out that this is indeed a lightning channel. But as you say, mm -hmm. you go around and gossip this transaction ID to everyone uh, and tell, hey, this is my lightning channel. You can route through it. And, um, do you foresee that here with uh, with this gossiping aspect that we can kind of improve the privacy a bit further in lightning? Um, so I, I, I kind of have two answers to this. Uh, first, I'll say I think private lightning channels have a lot of utility, especially in like a B2B set, a business to business setting. They don't necessarily want to use all of the routing uh, kind of aspects of the lightning network that say users and, and um, yeah, retail users might, uh, for example, something like strike as an application, I bet is using, I mean, actually, I, I don't know this, but in, if they aren't already, I assume in the future they will be using just like, you know, ch channels between all of the normal, you know, people who they are sending funds between for, for their users. And none of that stuff has to be public. Uh, so, so I guess, yeah, I, I think in the future we'll see a much larger use if it isn't already happening. Like we can't really know too well uh, of private channels. Um, but then on top of that, I guess I'll say another thing to keep in mind is that in the future, uh, not right now, but in the future, uh, Lightning channels will be able to host more than just HTLCs. So you'll be using the Lightning network for payments, but you can also say, put a DLC inside of a Lightning channel. You can put uh, all, all sorts of things inside of Lightning channels, uh, which will in turn mean that like sure maybe somebody can see where your public lightning channel is but they can't know what's in it still right they they don't know that you're using it to execute a bunch of off-chain dlcs where now those dlcs dlcs already leave almost no footprint very similar ones to lightning but once you put that stuff in a lightning channel now you have no footprint like it just disappears entirely in all cases but in case of dispute which is kind of the goal i mentioned right if if you have cooperating counterparties 
you can put these contracts inside of uh, an off-chain channel like a Lightning channel and execute these contracts in a fully trustless way where in, in the end, you never actually use the contracts. You like transfer the value in the Lightning channel and throw away the contract, so to speak, in the end. Uh, but if there's a dispute, then you go on chain is kind of the model. So I think Lightning in itself, although, you know, I think payments is like the awesome thing that works today in the future on top of payments, which will obviously still work, will also be able to do essentially any kind of contract that you can do on Bitcoin. You'll be able to take it off chain and have it be kind of fully private, fully scalable uh, setting where you're not paying fees on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, you you spoke a bit about the HTLC uh, part, um, but maybe let's let's define that first and and look into it a bit more closely. So, what how does it actually work when you make a Lightning Network channel update uh, to route payment? Yeah, so um, I, I guess that's kind of two separate things. So we have a mechanism for updating Lightning channels in general, and then we have uh, these HTLCs which can be used for uh, kind of coordinating multiple channel updates in different places on the Lightning Network. So to answer the first question, if I was just wanting to say pay Chris over a Lightning channel, and we have a channel open, and it's just a direct payment, no routing is happening, in theory, we wouldn't need to use an HTLC at all. We could just uh, update, right? say like I have uh, two thirds of a Bitcoin, and he has one third of a Bitcoin in this Lightning channel. Uh, we could just, and I want to pay him a third of a Bitcoin. We could just update to have a new state where I have one third and he has two thirds, and we can revoke the old state. So we have kind of this uh, more general update mechanism for Lightning channels. Uh, and then on top of that, we have uh, a way to coordinate uh, these updates. So how HTLCs come into this is say, Max, I want to pay you through Chris because I don't have a channel directly to you. And so what I do is I set up a contingent payment to Chris, where I tell him that he needs to reveal to me a secret that you know uh, in order to claim this payment. And he doesn't know this. And then I tell him, like, go go ask Max for that secret and pay him this much. So I'll pay him, say, uh, a bit more than a third of a Bitcoin for the secret. And then he will pay you a third of a Bitcoin for the same secret. And now what happens is, or so first of all, he waits for me to fully commit and revoke my old state. So now in our lightning channel state, I have one third of a Bitcoin, he has one third of a Bitcoin, and this HTLC kind of in the middle has a third of a Bitcoin, uh, which could go either way. It's a, it's a contingent payment, which either after a timeout goes back to me, or with the revealing of a secret goes to him. Um, and then he sets, once that's set up and fully committed to, only then does he go to you and set up that same contingent payment. And then uh, the reason that this is safe for him is because uh, his payment to you, the only way that he loses funds is if you tell him the secret. And if you tell him the secret, he's not going to lose funds because he can claim my payment. So essentially, HTLCs are this mechanism whereby routing nodes are sure that they are not going to be footed with the bill, so to speak. Right? They can always pass it on to someone else. So they make sure that someone is going to pay them for the secret before they commit to paying for the secret themselves. Um, and so that's what an HTLC is, is. It's a contingent payment. I mean, an, an HTLC is just a kind of Bitcoin contract, right? It's a contingent payment. Uh, and as I said, any, any kind of contingent payment that you can set up on-chain, you can do off-chain. And so essentially, we, we're setting up all of these off-chain contingent payments, and then... Uh, we all are essentially cooperatively not actually using those contracts on chain. We're just removing that and uh, transferring value. So then what happens here is Max will claim his payment from me, but actually it's from Chris. And um, by revealing the secret to Chris, and then Chris will claim his payment for me by revealing his secret, that secret to me as well. Um, and then when these secret reveals happen, Everyone updates their lightning channel to a new state where the value has transferred from one side to the other, and we just delete this HTLC. So we, it, this is a great example of like, it's a, an off-chain channel where we've introduced some contract on there, but then in, in the case that there's no dispute, we can just like throw that contract away and we don't need to use a blockchain to enforce it. 
Uh, but if there is a dispute, then uh, we can go on chain with this uh, channel. We can just put the channel, the current channel state on chain and then use the blockchain to enforce the contract. Oh, very, very well explained. Very nice. Uh, so, so you said that there can be HTLCs inside this payment channel, hashed time lock contracts, um, but then there can also be point time lock contracts, PTLCs in there. Uh, so could you explain the difference of these two uh, and again where we have a privacy improvement in the latter? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, an HTLC really is like just a Bitcoin contract that we have put in Lightning channels. So an HTLC, a hash time lock contract, is uh, just a payment that is contingent. And when I say reveal a secret uh, in, in my previous explanation, what I mean is we have uh, an output on the Bitcoin blockchain where Bitcoins are stored um, that can be spent in one of two ways. So there's like an if-else in the script. And one of the ways is that one key can sign for it, but they also have to reveal the pre-image to a hash. So we put this hash in the, in the output. So if this was ever to go on chain, this hash would be on chain. And then everyone is validating that uh, part of the script signature has the pre-image to this hash. So they take the secret, they hash it, check that it's the same. And then, so that's the validation that uh, can be done on chain. So uh, Bitcoin allows you to do hashing. So, and it allows you to do comparisons uh, with op hash and op equal. And so essentially uh, you can have a hash lock built in this way. So you have a hash lock. And then after that, you have a normal like pub key. You have to sign using this pub key. So one party can spend it using if they can reveal the pre-image to a hash. Or in the else case, after a certain timeout, so you have like an op uh, CLTV or an op CSV in there. Uh, so you have a time lock after a certain amount of time, then uh, this other key can spend it. So that's like the whole contract written out um, in, in Bitcoin script, so to speak. Uh, and that's what a, a hash time lock contract is. A point time lock contract uh, has a very similar function. It, it's intended to uh, be that uh, kind of the, the same exact thing where one party can claim it by revealing a secret or the other party can claim it after a timeout. Um, but how it's accomplished is much more interesting and it's essentially like an off-chain version of an HTLC. So what we do is... Um, so first of all, a point time lock contract is the same as an HTLC, but where rather than having to uh, reveal the pre-image to a hash, you have to reveal the scalar to a point. Or, uh, like, this is equivalent to saying, like, the uh, private key to a public key. Um, so, but the key thing is we don't want to think of these as uh, private and public keys that hold coins, necessarily. I don't think that that really makes sense But uh, in, in this context. But they are a private and a public key uh, in, in, like, the... In, you know, standard sense. So um, it, how this works exactly, let's see if I can explain this without going too deep. Um, what we do is, uh, so here's one way of doing it. So you have uh, a two of two multi-sig, say between me and Chris, and I want to send up, uh, I want this to be a payment uh, that either goes to him uh, if he reveals uh, the pre-image to a point to me, uh, or it goes back to me after a timeout. So what, what I do is I construct this two of two multi-sig between the, the both of us. And then off of that, kind of like in this off-chain sense, I have another transaction that spends this two of two um, and sends it to Chris. And then I have a, a transaction that spends this two of two that's time-locked that sends it to me. Um, and now what I do is instead of just signing both of so I sign the time-locked one and then the non-time lock one, I adapter sign. So what that means is I give Chris an encrypted signature um, that he can still verify. So this is a verifiably encrypted signature, uh, also known as an adapter signature. And then he gives me his signatures. And then we sign the two of two and, uh, or, sorry, and then I sign the two of two and we put that on chain. So all you see on the blockchain is a two of two multi-signature. And then at the time that the payment either goes to him or goes to me, uh, you either see just a transaction spending that and sending it to Chris or a transaction spending that and sending it to me. And you can see that that transaction has a time lock. So um, 
And, and then how this works is Chris can now claim this payment by decrypting my signature and using that valid signature. And that's really all there is to it. But then the cool thing that's happened here is that since I knew, and only me and Chris know this, I know the encrypted signature, and now I look on-chain and I see the decrypted signature, from those two things, I can actually compute the decryption key by, like, subtracting them, quite literally, uh, looking at the difference. Um, and so I only know the encryption key, so this public key, that's the point, and then I use that encryption key to encrypt my signatures, and if Chris claims... Uh, the money using this transaction by decrypting my signatures, he reveals to me the decryption key. So by using this mechanism with adapter signatures, we essentially can make uh, a, this PTLC where rather than revealing the pre-image to a hash, he has to give me the decryption key to an encryption key. Um, and uh, yeah, so... But then, as I mentioned, the thing that goes on chain just looks like kind of standard activity. There's no script that's being used to enforce this other than the, the two of two multisig, which again, in the future with Taproot will look like a single pub key. So PTLCs in the future are going to look exactly like normal transaction activity. There's nothing fancy happening in the script. Um, but off chain, we're doing this encryption stuff, which actually, if he wants to claim the funds, he will leak uh, the secret to me and me alone. Um, and then, yeah, so essentially to do this in Lightning, you take all that stuff and you move it into Lightning channels instead of doing it on chain where uh, you, you update the state. Um, and, and the nice thing about doing it off chain is we put this like two of two on our Lightning channel. And then in the case that we close it, we don't have to like go through all the transitions. We can just throw that two of two away and move the funds between us. So generally speaking, it's actually much less complex in terms of like all the steps that need to happen uh, because everyone's cooperating. But in the case that we aren't cooperating, then that two of two ends up on chain. And then uh, I, either Chris can spend it by uh, decrypting and using the signatures I gave him uh, and revealing that secret to me or after a certain time out at yeah, that, that really shows the beauty of these verifiably encrypted uh, signatures and these adapter signatures. Um, it basically, as soon as Chris makes a signature, he gives you the secrets to decrypt something else. And then if that decryption um, uh, is another signature to spend Bitcoin, that kind of has the, the uh, this atomic uh, spending uh, this, the, um, uh, involved. Um, yeah, 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 and so it's probably worth mentioning you can use them just as you use HTLCs essentially. So you know, in in the Lightning Network, we're going to use PTLCs to make payments, uh, multiple payments in different channels, atomic, so that we can do routing and things like this. Uh, but but the neat thing here is that with points, you can do all sorts of things that you can't do with hashes. Hashes destroy essentially all the information except for this is the hash of the secret. Um, and uh, whereas points are, it's still a one way function. You can't compute a private key from a public key, but you can like add two points together and that actually means something interesting. Or you can multiply a point by a number, like add it to itself a bunch of times and that can mean something interesting. Um, and, and yeah, that's what lets you do like, you can compute the points to a Schnorr signature without knowing the Schnorr signature just from public information. And then you could use that as like a payment point for uh, a Lightning Network payment. And then you can be assured that uh, if the payment completes, you re you learn the scalar to this point and you computed the point so that its scalar is a valid digital signature, a valid or digital signature of a specific message with a specific pub key. So you can do all sorts of interesting things uh, with PTLCs that you can't do with HTLCs. Uh, Chris, did you think about how you could use PTLCs to improve uh, that pay um, the, the paid uh, API? Oh gosh. Um, so I think uh, part of the reason we really got—it's hard to remember. It's probably two or three years ago now, but um, I think part of the reason why we started getting really interested in the PTLCs was because of the paid API. Um, one of the problems that comes up with the current Lightning Network is, uh, 
you know, the, the hash is revealed, uh, to every node along the payment route. So that means any node along the payment route can decrypt the payload that's intended only for the payor of the, uh, um, pair of the invoice. So, um, maybe, maybe I'm getting my historical context, uh, wrong here in the DAW. Does that, does that sound maybe right to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, it, it at least put it on our radar. I'm not sure if we, like, deep dived after, uh, right after that, but, um, certainly, uh, yeah, w- one way that PTLCs benefit something like a paid API is, uh, because I mentioned you can like add points together and do stuff like that, uh, in a PTLC based lightning network, rather than using the same hash everywhere, you use a tweak at every hop. So you have a different point at every single spot where, right, we still have to make sure that every routing node, uh, is off the hook, like they, they aren't footed with the bill. So essentially the, each routing node has like someone comes to them and says, here's some money if you can reveal the scaler to this point. And then they are also in the onion. They're given just an extra nonce, like an extra secret. And then they add that, like they tweak that point with the secret. And then they ask the next person for this tweaked pre-image. And, um, but they can still know that they're not going to be footed with the bill because they know what the tweak is. So now, um, each routing node is essentially like adding a tweak moving forward, uh, on the points and then subtracting a tweak from the secret moving backward on the scalers. Um, and so that makes it so that only the originator of the payment learns that specific pre-image to this point, like say a signature point or anything else, uh, a decryption key for some data. Um, and everyone else along the route learns a random secret. Like you just add random numbers at every hop. Uh, and so they, they don't actually get this decryption key. So that, that does make kind of this, this paid model, uh, better in, in all the ways. Uh, like one of the things that I think came up around that time too was uh, I believe there's a class of attack vectors called wormhole attacks on the Lightning Network. I may, I may be getting my um, names mixed up here, but like one of the other things people can do is like surround your Lightning node and make sure you can't claim fees by like basically being on having two of your own nodes along the routing graph, and then you essentially pass that payment pre-image from your node that's further downstream in the routing graph upstream to circumvent like a certain set of people, and I believe you can claim all the fees um, along the way if you do execute this kind of attack. So, like, there's like PTLCs are really good in a lot of different ways. I, I mean, I don't know of any. Um, Long-standing criticism against them, other than you know we need Taproot to get them. Um, once you know we we have Taproot, uh, I, I I think the Lightning Network developers hopefully move pretty quickly to adopt this because it does really solve a whole bunch of different problems. Yeah, I think the the only real criticism is that they might add a tiny bit of latency, but I mean it's it, like even that latency is nothing compared to like backup latency in the future if people want to do backups and. The, and any other kind of scheme that improves lightning. Um, and then the, the trade-off is very much worth it. The, the extra latency, by the way, is because now we have uh, kind of this one extra step instead of using Bitcoin script or using another off-chain transaction. Um, but yeah, I, I guess there's a, this very tiny, uh, almost negligible, I, I won't call it negligible, um, uh, adding of, of it, it takes just a little bit longer to do an update. But uh, in return, it solves a bunch of problems. It makes it so that wormhole attacks aren't possible. It makes it so that uh, payments become decorrelated. So like each hop along the route uh, doesn't have like a fingerprint that tells it that it's part of the same payment, which, by the way, is made much, much worse with uh, multipath payments because every single subpayment along a multipath payment uses the same hash these days. Um, and in the future, it'll just all be decorrelated. I always kind of think of it like with current multi-payments, it's like turning um, the Lightning Network into a gossiping network for uh, payment free images because like Nadav said, it's like now instead of just having yourself 
your payment pretty much is on one route that's exposed along n different routes. Um, so yeah, that said, uh, yeah, I guess it, so. That's another thing. Uh, PTLCs will allow proof of payment, meaning like this payment pre-image. Uh, to actually be a proof of payment as opposed to many people on the network learning it. Only one person learns it. And furthermore, there are lots of schemes that have been proposed in Lightning, uh, which could be done today, but which sacrifice uh, the ability to have a proof of payment. Uh, so, for example, AMPs, uh, not MPPs, but AMPs, uh, as uh, I think uh, Conrad Lightning Labs just, uh, they, they just uh, enabled some AMP-related stuff on LND. Um, where these payments are actually like a bunch of different sub payments uh, that are actually atomic in a way that MPPs aren't, and they also have different hashes, but um, they don't have a. Pr- There's no invoice mechanism for these things. There's no proof of payment uh, associated with them either. Um, and when we have PTLCs, we'll be able to kind of get the best of both worlds, where we'll have everything decorrelated, actually atomic, and will have a proof of payment. And this is kind of true for a lot of different schemes. There's like the stuckless payment proposal, which you could do today if you didn't want there to be a proof of payment involved. But in the future, you'll be able to do it and have a proof of payment involved. So it kind of reintroduces proof of payment to most schemes when you use PTLCs. And then there's also kind of this whole class of other things not related to proof of payment uh, directly and uh, not related to payment decorrelation, which is just like brand new stuff you can do with PTLCs that you can't do with um, HTLCs, such as like trustlessly buying signatures and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. So we talked about both having hash time lock contracts in Lightning channels, but then also these point time lock contracts. But now you say that we can even have uh, discrete lock contracts in these Lightning channels. Um, so first, maybe get over the basics of what is actually that DLC and how does it differ from HTLCs and PTLCs? Yeah, so since I've already explained what a PTLC is, I think I can take some shortcuts here because uh, it uses basically the same idea uh, of using adapter signatures. So uh, just like a PTLC, it starts with a two of two multisig um, on chain and then some transactions that spend it. So the difference here, though, is rather than just having one uh, point-locked transaction spending it, where by point-locked, I mean that it's just a normal-looking transaction, but where rather than giving Chris or my counterparty a signature, I gave them an encrypted signature, meaning that they have to find out what the uh, scalar is to that point in order to use it, use the signature on-chain. And then when they use it, they reveal that, that the, the secret to me. So um, how a DLC works is um, you have an oracle, which is going to be attesting to an event in the future. Um, say you have like a Bitcoin price oracle, which is going to assign like a number, like what the price is um, in at uh, say some time next week, like some specific time. Uh, what they do is they give or, or they, they make their public information public, right? They have their public key. Uh, and then they also have to uh, have this extra public uh, key commitment to this specific event, um, which is the public key of their nonce, essentially, that they're going to be using in the signature. And then from that public information, kind of like I mentioned earlier for selling signatures on Lightning, you can compute the point whose scalar is the signature. So I can't compute the signature, but from the public information alone, I can compute for every possible message they could sign. I could compute a point, uh, which is the point whose, uh, essentially I can compute a key, a public key whose private key is the signature for that message with these keys. Um, and so what you do is you go through all the possibilities. Say, uh, just to make things easy, they're going to sign, uh, either, uh, over 50k or under 50k for next week. So there are two messages that they could sign. Um, and then for each of these messages using their public information and that message, I can compute the point. And then I use each of these points as the encryption key for a different off-chain transaction. So I have this two of two, and then I have a transaction which spends it, which corresponds to the over 50k case. Say I win in that case and I get the money. Or And then there's another transaction that spends it for the under 50k case. Say Chris gets the money in that case. And then for the over 50k 
transaction, I encrypt my signatures with the over 50k signature public key. And then uh, for the other one, we use the under 50k signature public key as the encryption key. Uh, and then, you know, we can have a refund time locks thing in case the Oracle goes offline, say, a time locked one. Um, and then what happens is in the future, the Oracle releases one and only one signature. They've committed to a nonce, so if they release more than one, they leak their private keys because of nonce reuse. Um, so they, they release one and only one signature, which will unlock one and only one of these off-chain transactions. So either the over 50k transaction or the under 50k transaction, the signatures on them will be unlocked. And then either me or Chris can publish broadcast that transaction now. Um, and yeah, so essentially we use point locks, but unlike a PTLC where one party funds this two of two, and then there's one point locked transaction and one time locked transaction, that's how a PTLC works. A DLC is where both parties can fund this two of two multi-signature, so both parties post some collateral. And then there are many point locked transactions, one for each possible outcome and one time locked transaction, say for a refund. Uh, and then exactly one of these point locks becomes unlocked based on what the Oracle says. And then the important thing to keep in mind is that since we only used the Oracle for our encryption of things, our actual like Bitcoin transactions are just vanilla looking Bitcoin transactions. They have no trace of anything to do with our contract or our oracles or anything. It's just a normal transaction where the signature is also just a normal signature, but then off-chain I encrypt that signature using oracle information, and then Chris decrypts it using the oracle signature. Um, and then, yeah, so essentially the on-chain footprint for a DLC is very minimal. It's actually very similar to a lightning channel, some funds going to a 2 of 2 multisig. And then later, a transaction spends it sending funds in some of two directions, uh, say, just like a lightning channel closing. Um, and then in the future with Taproot, right, this will look just like some funds being moved into this one pub key and then that being moved into two different ones that, you know, that could be a payment with some change or something. You can't tell the difference. Um, and so, yeah, un under Taproot, all of this stuff will look just like normal ac uh, financial activity. These days, it looks very similar to just normal lightning activity, or it looks the same. You can't tell the difference. And it leaks nothing about your contract itself. There's nothing about what your payout curve was, who gets what in what situation, what oracle you used, what event you're making your payment contingent on. All of that stuff is all off-chain and hidden just between your counterparts. Yeah, that's quite amazing. Right, because if you think about the possibilities that that could en enable, it, it's vast. It's super huge. Like anything that two people could agree upon, <laughs> basically, uh, you could uh, like put into a solid contract like this. Um, yeah, and I think it's it's just a really great example of like when you think about contingent payments or smart contracts on Bitcoin. Like this is how you do it. You you use some cryptography. You use some off chain transactions. And then the only thing that you actually use the blockchain for is to transfer value. Like the only thing that we have here is money being moved into a shared custody spot and then money being moved back to me and Chris in some proportion. And that's the only thing we're using the blockchain for. Everything else is done off chain using cryptography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very much. Um, but so as I understand this correctly, uh, you already need to know the message and the public key that the Oracle has in the sign. Yes. So we, the, an Oracle does two things. They publish announcements saying, I, in the future, will attest to this thing. Here's the public information you need. Here are the messages I might sign. And then uh, the second thing that they do is they public attestate, or they, they uh, broadcast attestations, which are their actual signatures using the previously announced information. Um, the, those commitments anyway, they sign one of those messages in their attestation. So they have announcements that they make public, and then later, after the thing happens in the real world, say, um, then they publish an attestation, which closes the contract. And for a little little bit of showing here, you know, we're coming out with a new product that helps uh, users find reliable oracles. Um, we're calling it the Oracle Explorer, the Shred Bits Oracle Explorer. Um, you, it, you can think of it kind of like a block explorer. With a block explorer, you know, you'll go and find, uh, oh, what uh, block is my transaction in? What are the outputs on the transaction, etc. 
Um, with the Oracle Explorer, uh, we're building tools for DLC users to find high quality oracles that are testing to events that they're interested in. So like, just to reiterate, um, you know, you can't do any DLCs if you don't have an oracle that's willing to attest to the outcome they're interested in. So, uh, me and Nicholas Dorier, who you mentioned you had on this podcast, uh, earlier, uh, we did a United States presidential election DLC. Um, however, to, you know, do that DLC, we needed a third party oracle that was willing to sign who won the United States presidential election. Uh, that ended up being an observer on Twitter. Uh, you can go find him twitter.com slash the outcome observer. And he, uh, published the cryptographic information we needed beforehand to create all of our DLC transactions. And by then published being tweeted, right? <laughs> tweet, he tweeted all the, I mean, this is again, just goes to show how powerful this stuff is. You can tweet out this information, distribute it as widely as possible anywhere, anywhere on the face of the earth. You know, people can create Bitcoin transactions based on what the Oracle tweeted without the Oracle actually even knowing that they're creating these transactions. And then, you know, once the presidential election was settled, he broadcasts his signatures. And then anybody that had DLCs predicated on the Oracle information can go and use those signatures to settle those transactions. So, you know, with the power, I mean, with a couple of tweets, you can possibly be settling billions of dollars of Bitcoin transactions, uh, just to go and show like, you know, how just powerful this technology is, how private this technology is, and how flexible this technology is too. I mean, it's really remarkable, uh, you know, the, the use cases that are enabled by this stuff. And, you know, we're just barely scratching the surface here. But with the Oracle Explorer, the point of it is to help cultivate the healthy Oracle ecosystem. Because if we have bad Oracles or don't have any Oracles at all, the DLC ecosystem can't uh, exist and progress. So um, that's, you know, where we think a sort of a company angle comes into play here is, you know, making sure we're, uh, promoting a healthy Oracle ecosystem and helping users find these oracles so that they can enter into their DLCs. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that the most cypherpunk way to publish such oracle messages uh, would be through a satellite message for with Bitcoin <laughs> over the lightning. <laughs> so uh, that would be great if you can receive... Yeah, that or IRC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty yes. much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, we want to make sure that we're, uh, you know, we're at the stage of the DLC ecosystem where we want to get oracles onboarded, get people familiar with the, the technology and make sure, again, we have high quality oracles because oracles can also lie. Um, you do need to make sure you are picking your oracles carefully when you're doing your DLC because, you know, DLCs at the end of the day are trust minimized, not trustless. Uh, you are trusting the Oracle to attest to the right outcome. So there is um, certain considerations that come into play there. So, you know, just being fully transparent. And we want to pro help provide tooling to make sure you're making a, a good choice in that regard. Mm -hmm. Right. The Oracle can sign anything or not even sign anything at all, right? Go offline. So both cases are an issue. Yeah. Um, and just to, I mean, for the second case that you're talking about, that's another great point. Uh, they can just not sign anything at all. And uh, from day zero, really, with the DLC protocol, we built in refund mechanisms. So, you know, we figured the default Ferris case is to have people just refunded their initial collateral in the case that the Oracle disappears and doesn't uh, do anything. Um, of course, this can be customized if, you, you know, for your certain use case, you think there's another fair refund mechanism, but by default, we, we think that that's probably the best uh, uh, setting. Yeah, a random thought that just popped into my head. You could customize the refund so that you can hedge against Oracles not signing anything. And then you could open a DLC where either one person gets money if they sign anything and the other party gets money if they don't. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's like the, the joy of like, uh, you know, this DLC protocol development is, you know, you got all these interesting cases. We've also like loaded uh, a case of, you know, I have been hacked, like what, what you want to do in that case. And, uh, you know, the, the, these things really are extremely flexible and, uh, and allow for a ton of use cases to you know, be realized. Yeah, and one specific thing probably worth mentioning at this point is that you can use multiple oracles. You aren't bound to using just one. So uh, that, that does make the, the security of these things 
uh, much nicer to, to say use like two of three or three of five or five of nine or whatever it is you want to use. Um, and yeah. how is that actually achieved? Is that with key and signature aggregation? Basically, uh, not, not, uh, it's, uh, not the same aggregation as like you would see on like music or something like that, but it is, it is, yeah, you, you add some stuff together. Um, and again, since all of this Oracle information is really just, uh, being used off chain as encryption keys, we're just like adding together a bunch of encryption keys in a bunch of ways. Um, and, uh, all that stuff is happening off chain. And in the end, you still end up with just like a normal transaction hitting the blockchain. But yeah, essentially, um, you, you do some fancy off chain stuff, aggregating keys and, uh, you can, for example, imagine. So here's, I can walk through a simple example. So say you're doing like a two of three for my earlier example with over under 50 K oracles. Um, so say you have three oracles, all of which are signing over 50 K or under 50 K. And you want, if any two of them agree, you can execute on that. So what you do is you take all pairs of them. So like, uh, say Alice, Bob, and Carol, you have Alice, Bob, Alice, Carol, Bob, Carol. So you have those three things. And then for each of those three pairs, there are two possible outcomes, right? Over 50K and under 50K being what they agree on. So in total, you have six possible executable outcomes, right? Alice, Bob, sign over. Alice, Bob, sign under. Alice, Carol, sign over. Alice, Carol, sign under. Bob. Carol sign over, Bob Carol sign under. And then what you do is um, you compute the signature points, say, for uh, Alice signing over and Bob signing over, and then you add those things together. Uh, and you have to make sure that uh, you have proofs of knowledge of the nonces so you don't have key cancellation attacks and all the rest of it. But we have security proofs uh, nearly done. Uh, Lloyd Fournier is, he told me sometime this week, I don't want to put him on the spot. If, if it takes him a bit longer, that's okay. But he's working on security proofs for all this stuff. Um, but yeah, you essentially you just take those encryption keys, add them together. Now you have an encryption key that, rep that can, whose decryption key is the sum of these two signatures. So we're, we're kind of doing signature aggregation here. Uh, yeah, and then um, you you have all the all six cases, and now you have a two of three uh, oracle scheme for for that same contract. Uh, and yeah, all of these things get more complicated with numeric contracts because so in theory you could do all of this stuff exactly as I described it for numeric outcomes. Um, but in reality, like if an oracle could sign any number between zero and a million or something, like that's a million off-chain transactions, a million adapter signatures from each party, and now you add like a three x or a, a yeah a, a three x multiplier if you want to do a two of three. For a larger multiplier for larger, um, that that can get uh, pretty hairy. So what you um, what you actually end up doing is I, I've come up with a bunch of these compression algorithms where we can cover arbitrary payout curves using relatively few CETs. Um, or sorry, using relatively few off-chain transactions, uh, and there's specifications open on the DLC specs for all of that stuff. So this stuff can get quite complicated for how we do it. But at the end of the day, we're just constructing a bunch of uh, encryption points which correspond to specific outcomes. And then um, we use those encryption keys to do adapter signatures of transactions which pay out to that, to what you would expect for that outcome. Um, yeah, but I, I just want to preface with we have multi-oracle stuff and it works. And we even have it working practically even for large numeric contracts. Um, it gets quite a bit more complicated than what I've described for how that's accomplished, but it does work. And we will be writing blog posts about it soon. Yes, we, so and and we've written blog posts about some of it as well, but not yeah. all of it. So maybe, maybe by the time this podcast is out, uh, we'll have some uh, you know working uh, transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain that people can go inspect if they'd like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one of the features uh, of, of DLCs is that the Oracle cannot sign two messages um, at the same time, right? So it cannot say, uh, uh, you know, soccer team A1 and soccer team B1 at the same time. The reason for that is because that would leak its private key, actually, right? Because of, uh, well, nonce release and such. But I, I was wondering, now, what if you want to have, like, multiple conditions um, from the same Oracle? Like... Uh, you want to know that the weather is blue sunny and that uh, the Bitcoin price is over 5,000. 
And only when these two conditions meet should the DLC go through. Now, how do you create that? Uh, it's actually much simpler than you think. So in some sense, multi-oracle is, uh, or multi-oracle support is just an example of a compound event DLC, right? Alice signs this and Bob signs this, right? So what we do is we uh, essentially set up all of the math that we need to compute these encryption points like normal. And then if you want to have a, a transaction that pays out according to the event, it's sunny and the price is over 50k. You take the encryption key for it's sunny. You take the encryption key for it's over 50k. You validate the proofs of knowledge and all the other technical details. But then you add those things together. And now you have an encryption key for the event. It's sunny and it's over 50k. And then you use that to encrypt an off-chain transaction signatures. Yeah. Wow. I mean, <laughs> this is really so amazing. I like that tag. It's just beautiful. Yeah. And then on top of that, uh, we, we have... Uh, so, so that's how you do ands to do ors. Um, you just have multiple transactions. Uh, so you, you do, uh, yeah. So essentially, you can, you can think of uh, so a two of two oracle scheme is like a fully and kind of situation, but a two of three has ors in it, right? It's Alice and Bob, or Alice and Carol, or Bob and Carol. And how you do that is you just you construct more transactions, and then if any one of them works, you can use that to execute. And like if you start like really like thinking about this as like you know, you're decomposing things into like you know boolean kind of logic, and you can start uh, thinking about all in- sorts of interesting ways to construct like circuit like things to execute DLC. Uh, I don't know. It, it it really is beautiful, and like to maybe come full circle here is like you come back to like you know the the, the math angle of this, and uh, that's uh, um, sort of where we started, I guess, is, you know... Yeah. And at the end of the day, like, all of this stuff is accomplished, and the only thing that you do on-chain is two of two multisig. Like, that's the most complicated thing. Everything else is one of one. Like, it's all just single pub keys everywhere, except for this one place where we have a two of two, which in the future under Taproot will also be a one of one. <laughs> right? Like, the only thing that you need a blockchain for to execute arbitrary Oracle contracts is signature validation. That's all you need. <laughs> like you don't need anything else. Like signature and I guess uh validating that the UTXOs are funded. Like, you know, just normal like the the base like the very base of what Bitcoin can do is like transfer value by validating signatures is all you need to do all this stuff. And uh because that's all we have, we're forced to do it this way and this way is the scalable private nice way. Yeah, and it's it's so mind blowing. Like the potential use cases for this, what you could build. I mean, you know, the the easiest thing you can come up with is, is betting right on the price of Bitcoin. It's basically a contract for difference, right? Well, that that makes Deutsche Bank obsolete as like the largest derivative counterparty, right? And you explain it with a little bit of math and a little bit of Bitcoin, and that eats a billion, a trillion dollar market. <laughs> and puts that into cyberspace. Like that's incredible. Yeah, I mean, like once you start like reading into like the financial engineering that kind of goes on behind the scenes with uh, you know very large like institutions, like you mentioned Deutsche Bank or like even the energy markets, like they have like custom forward contracts like written out. This can all be done in like Bitcoin, and um, you know it all happens off chain, not parasitic to Bitcoin by you know executing like ten thousand transactions on chain. Uh, you know, there are a lot of transactions associated with DLCs, but the beauty of it is like, that's okay because it's all off chain, stored locally between the two counterparties or in counterparties to the DLC it is not like polluting the global, um, transaction space. And only one of these transactions ends up on the chain at the end of the day. So, yeah. Um, and to that note, it's very similar. If you think of a lightning channel, it, in a lightning channel, you have a ton of transactions, right? Every single state update that would have been an on-chain transaction, you still have as an off-chain transaction. But the thing is, they all spend the same output, which means only one of them can ever end up on-chain anyway. So it's the same in a DLC. You have a ton of off-chain transactions, potentially, um, but only one on-chain transaction ever. Um, Can I fund a DLC contract via a route in the Lightning Network? Or do I have to open the channel uh, to the to the counterparty? On chain. Uh, are you talking about on chain DLCs? Uh, no, uh, no in Lightning. Like okay, so Lightning, direct DLCs. Lightning channel. 
to gotcha. uh, to make these DLCs work. Yes and no. Uh, so you, if you have a direct channel, you can just put this two of two multi sig on that channel and have transaction spending that and do your DLC inside of the Lightning channel, just like you would do, say, a PTLC or an HTLC uh, inside of a Lightning channel, and that works. Um, it, it, it's also, I think, the way to go if you want to make like synthetic asset channels and stuff on Lightning, but uh, that's kind of a, a tangent. So, um, But then the other thing I want to say is that once we have PTLCs, because I've kind of mentioned this, a DLC is just a combination of some ands and ors of a bunch of point locks. On, on some transactions. So there are some really somewhat complicated ways I've come up with where you can actually construct a DLC using the combination of a bunch of PTLCs, which can be routed over the Lightning Network. Uh, so the first thing we'll see is just in channel, you must have a direct channel to this person, we'll execute DLCs in that channel kind of thing. Uh, but then in the more distant future, once we have PTLCs and some other things related to PTLCs, working on the Lightning Network, we will be able to actually do DLCs in a routed fashion over the Lightning Network. Yeah, amazing. Uh, at that, that point, really, the possibilities are, are endless, and the scalability of it rapid. So. Totally. And, and actually, I think I have a nice simple example of how this would work routed on the Lightning Network. So say you have a PTLC-based Lightning Network, um, then what two parties could do who, you know, there's some route between them, they don't have a, a direct connection. What they can do is they say a, a super simple example, like we've been doing over and under 50k. Um, so say it's a two BTC bet, each party puts in one BTC just to make numbers nice. And then one card, if it goes over 50, I get two BTC. And if it goes under, then Chris gets two BTC. How we can construct this is I set up a PTLC to Chris where he can claim one BTC if he can reveal the pre-image to this signature point under 50k, right? Where under 50k is what I use to construct the signature point, uh, just like we've been using uh, on, on DLCs on-chain. And then he can set up a transaction to me, a PTLC, sorry, um, for one Bitcoin that says I get this one Bitcoin if I can reveal the over 50 signature point. And now, uh, say the Oracle signs over 50, then I can claim my payment for one Bitcoin and he can't claim his. So he will just cancel his, he'll fail his. And so I end up getting two BTC, uh, my one Bitcoin in collateral back and his one Bitcoin. But if it went the other way, it would go the other way. And uh, Chris would get my one BTC and get his one BTC back. Um, now, the only hiccup here is that we need a way for me and him to set up both of these PTLCs atomically, right? If I set up a PTLC to him first, He's never going to send one to me. Like, he just got a free option, essentially. Um, but we need a way to set up multiple payments at the same time. Luckily, we've devised a scheme for atomic multi-payment setup with PTLCs. So once we have PTLCs, we can also do that. And essentially how that works is we take these two PTLCs and then we extend them into an AMP to some third party, which just ex takes this tiny fee. And they're literally these parties, we call them barrier escrows. They literally are just on the network accepting amps. So people set up amps to them, and then they're like, once all of the payments have been set up, they're like, okay, free money, and then they take it. Like, that's all that they do. Um, and then uh, this way, uh, not, my payment to Chris won't be set up before his payment to me. Like, either neither of them get set up, or both of them get set up because uh, this barrier escrow claims both of the payments, and then essentially people claim going back to me and Chris, but then me and Chris can't claim because we need this extra Oracle signature point in order to claim. So uh, if you didn't understand that, that's okay. High level is we can do atomic multi-payment setup using PTLCs on the Lightning Network. And once you have that, we have PTLCs. And so we can set up DLCs as the combination of many sub-payments, essentially, going in both directions. Chris, I'm curious. What are your favorite use cases for DLCs as an entrepreneur? Um, well, I'm really excited about what a team in, out of Canada is building, Atomic Finance. Uh, right now, they're working on uh, making it, uh, giving the ability for users to earn yield on their hodlings for Bitcoin in a non-custodial way. So, you know, most people that own Bitcoin right now, um, especially if they want to make sure they retain custody, you know. 
put their Bitcoin on, you know, a piece of paper or a hardware wallet or on, you know, very dark place somewhere that the Bitcoin's super secure. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't allow you to uh, use your Bitcoin to gain yield on it and keep accruing value and putting your capital to work. Um, Atomic Finance is working on a product that allows hodlers to sell covered call options for Bitcoin. So basically how this would work with a DLC is uh, one party puts up the premium to purchase the option in Bitcoin. The other party puts up the full, for round numbers, we'll just call it one Bitcoin, that can be transferred to the uh, option purchaser contingent upon an Oracle signature. So um, to walk us through an example, let's just say uh, Nadav is looking to purchase an option. I am a hodler of Bitcoin and I'm looking to uh, you know, make some yield on my Bitcoin. Um, we'll just say our theoretical strike price for the option is 100K. And now what this means is um, if the Oracle that me and Nadav chooses broadcasts that the price is over, uh, Bitcoin price is over 100K at the maturity date, um, Nadav can exercise as his option and take my one Bitcoin of hodlings that he purchased in exchange for the premium uh, of the option. Now, if the Bitcoin price is under 100K, I would just get to keep the premium of the option uh, that Nadav put up front for uh, the right to purchase that Bitcoin if it was over 100K. So, and all this is done in a shared custodial way or non-custodial way. Um, me and Nadav, we're in the two of two multi-sig for the duration of the option. We're waiting for the Oracle to, per- uh, to broadcast the price at the expiration. And then depending upon what the price is, we, um, you know, have the Bitcoin go one way or the other way, depending on what the outcome is. But uh, again, the powerful concept here is it allows people to start earning interest or yield on their Bitcoin hodlings without throwing it into some sort of uh, uh, not or some some sort of custodial platform like BlockFi here in the United States. So I I think that has the potential to be a very popular product, um, especially amongst uh, Bitcoin hodlers that are security and privacy uh, sensitive. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Now, how about you, Nada? What are you most excited to find with see out in the wild with DLC magic? <laughs> so th- this might be a ways out still. Um, so you know, it won't be part of V zero or anything. But once we get DLCs on Lightning, I'm actually very excited for DLCs inside of uh, individual Lightning channels, where uh, they will be used to enforce trustless uh, synthetic assets inside of Lightning channels. So I like to call this stable not a coins, um, uh, where essentially um, there, there's this idea of like say uh, if you've heard of like the rainbow network or rainbow channels, where um, you can imagine since we have this off chain payment channel, say me and Chris, uh, I, say I want fixed USD value on my satoshis uh, in this channel for whatever purpose. Um, then if the Bitcoin price goes up, I send him a payment over the Lightning Network. And if it goes down, then he sends me a payment over the Lightning Network. Uh, that way I get a fixed. So let's say I have $100, price goes up, now I have 110 I give him $10. And now if the price goes down uh, and I have $90 now, he sends me $10 worth. So I have $100 fixed. Uh, but then I can use the Lightning Network, you know, pay people. And they could be also, say, using these channels. So to them, it looks like I'm paying them dollars or euros or satoshis if they want um so that's that's kind of the the high level idea now the problem and where dlcs come into this is as i just described it i mean sure it's just micro transactions right we could like be doing this following the price every 10 seconds something right so it's, it's never going to be a huge amount that needs to be sent back and forth uh but what if the price like does a 10k candle or something right like one party is not going to want to pay up <laughs> in, in that situation. So the problem here is that if you do it the way I just described, it's it's a fully trusted mechanism, right? You're just trusting your counterparty to pay you because maybe you'll pay them later. Um, but uh, that's not great. So the first iteration on this was the idea that what, we could have only one side be trusted. So one side could be a trusted service and they could hold collateral of the other side. So if the other side refuses to pay, then the side could just take their collateral or something like that. Uh, but this requires trust on one side, so it's not really peer-to-peer. 
with DLCs, we can kind of fully get to this vision of having it be trustless on both sides. What you do is rather than one party holding another's collateral for the biggest possible move, for example, that they could imagine, um, like an upper bound on it, you instead have a DLC sit in the middle of the channel, like on the channel, holding the largest move, and it holds collateral from both parties. So then what happens is every time that a payment goes from one side to the other, we also throw this DLC away and update it with a new one. Um, but So essentially now we do it, just as I said, we pay each other based on the price moving. But if the price uh, moves against one of us and like someone misbehaves, rather than just getting away with it, you use the DLC to ex to force like forcibly take those those collateral funds from them. So essentially, it removes the counterparty trust in place of using some multi oracle scheme where you're putting some trust in the oracles instead of a new counterparty, and then um, on top and you know you're already trusting oracles if you're doing this because you're following a Bitcoin price in order to move funds back and forth. So really, we're just taking trust away here. So you take trust away, no counterparty trust needed. You have a DLC that sits on your channel holding collateral, and now you can unilaterally take funds from your counterparty if the price moves against them using this DLC. If they're not cooperating, if they are cooperating, you can just have them send you those funds and throw that DLC away, plop a new one on the channel for the next time interval. Uh, so essentially, this allows you to follow any index, and so you can create synthetic assets and all sorts of other cool things inside of Lightning Channels. Yeah, yeah, that that market for contract for defenses is so big, <laughs> so big. And again, because this is built on Bitcoin, a free and open network, like a, a twelve-year-old kid out of Timbuktu can do that, right? And that's just insane, insane. Yeah, and and kind of like you mentioned for how there's such a big market for something like a CFD. I mean, it pairs one one side of the contract to someone who wants to go long Bitcoin. And the other side of the contract is someone who wants like a stable coin. And, you know, we have both of those people in existence. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very excited by that being a thing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, further, um, just the fact that there exists the possibility that someone might be doing DLC craziness, this breaks so many on-chain privacy heuristics. Like, common input ownership heuristic is broken, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, there's so much more, con so much more economic metadata for each transaction eh, that it kind of becomes meaningless to try to spy on the one transaction. Because even if you look at it, there's so, like, all the valuable information, all the actual economic activity going on is not even there. <laughs> so that is just such a, a massive, massive, massive improvement. Yeah, and on top of that, DLCs will be part of the very large set of applications, which when we have Taproot, will just become single pub key spends everywhere. So we, we DLCs will also add to that anonymity set. They won't have yeah. to be a part of their own. Um, yeah, so it, it'll it'll be great on that front too. You know, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, oh, sorry, one 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 last thing um, that that I think you'll really appreciate. Another uh, protocol suggestion that I think Ben has come up with uh, at Shared Bits is to, he calls them chow main DLCs. And the idea is that you take a bunch of people who are doing DLCs and you make it into a coin. Or so these people have to be using the same oracles for this to work. Let's say there are a bunch of people executing on some price. You can essentially uh, do a coin join with these people where right when that oracle signature is broadcast, it closes this entire coin join and pays everyone out what they're worth. So it like nets everyone's DLCs together into one very large multi-party DLC. Ah, uh -huh. now that sounds extremely fascinating. And then you can also just have normal coin join activity that has nothing to do with the oracle in there as well. So you can like hide, as you mentioned, economic metadata. Like some of these coin join outputs were DLC outputs, and some of them were just normal and all that. And stuff. Some of them were were coin swaps that uh, ended up completely different on chain, right? And some yeah. were lightning channel openings. Um, good luck trying to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if if only there would be a contract for difference where I can short chain analysis companies. <laughs> uh, hey, I mean, if you can get an oracle to attest to uh, like their stock price or something, you you got it. 
<laughs> Fantastic. I'm so curious. When can I run uh, like the DLC uh, code? Uh, when is this actually production ready? And at, this, at a point where it's actually useful for multiple people to provide these Oracle services. Yeah, so I mean, we're just getting to the point of starting to get a little bit more aggressive about promoting Oracle services. You know, like I had mentioned before, we're going to be releasing this uh, Sherbits Oracle Explorer product along with a useful tool that uh, Ben built called Crystal Bowl. Um, it's a very fun, and Ben is a very talented marketer along with engineer, and uh, he also has incorporated the uh, the laser eyes into the crystal bowl product that you'll have to come and see. I don't know. Uh, that's a, that's a very popular contemporary thing on Twitter right now is everybody having laser eyes. So our crystal bowl, uh, standalone application will have that, but, uh, sorry, tangent. Um, crystal bowl is a standalone desktop application that allows for anybody to run this software, become an Oracle, attest to events coming, happening in the real world. And uh, then distributing that cryptographic information, the Oracle announcement, so that other people can uh, construct DLCs predicated on the attestment that uh, you uh, later would provide. So um, we're really focusing in 2021 to start bringing the tooling to market instead of, uh, you know, working on mostly the protocol stuff is what we did in 2020. So that's going to be a reoccurring theme you're going to see from us this year. And, you know, maybe by the end of 2021, DLCs will be more mainstream and have uh, hopefully a lot of adoption behind them. Yeah, and on on that front, uh, Chris mentioned we worked on the protocol a bunch in 2020, and uh, so there's a V0 milestone on the DLC specs that is uh, being quickly approached, uh, after which um, you'll see, I think, two or three, maybe even four different uh, DLC clients that are all interoperable that are spec compliant. Um, that are ready to go. So I, I would say right now we already have all of this code. Like it works. It's not in its final state. We want it. We want to have a nice specification where all of these clients can interop, kind of like how there are a bunch of different Lightning implementations that follow the bolts that work together. Um, and so you know, in theory, if you want to go pull down uh, the adapter DLC branch of Bitcoin S and do stuff right now, you can if you have an Oracle for it. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll probably be releasing a more uh, official and stable version of the actual client code on uh, not only Bitcoin S, but also Rust DLC and uh, a project in C++ called CFD and a project. I, I think Nicola Doria is also working on a BTC Pay Server compatible DLC clients in C Sharp. Um, and all of that stuff uh, hopefully also will be coming uh, this year. Uh, where we'll have a nice stable uh, base layer for the specification to build off of that all of these clients will be compatible with, which will uh, you know be also compatible with uh, all the Oracle stuff that Chris just mentioned as well. Yeah, so I mean, if you're listening to this podcast and you're interested in DLCs, uh, you know, go bug your wallet provider about looking into supporting DLCs in their wallet. And you know, while it may not happen overnight, um, you know, of course, wallet providers do need to know what to prioritize their time with. So tell them that this is something that's important to you, if this is something that you're interested in, so they can begin the process of reaching out to us and learning about the protocol, understanding you know how the bits and pieces work together, and uh, you know they can get it on the roadmap for integration. And if you know people aren't reaching out to them, telling them that this is something that you're interested in, uh, you know they 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 don't know that at the end of the day either. So uh, make sure you communicate. Yeah, and now is a good time for that because we on Bitcoin S not only do we have uh, an implementation of the DLC protocol, but we also have a proof of concept DLC wallet on an experimental branch, which delegate which uses kind of the core implementation and, and into a wallet. So we're I, I would say you know now would be a good time for for other wallets to start you know looking into and maybe even starting to build some of the stuff that they need in order to support DLCs. Yeah, yeah, I, I am in somewhat of that position uh, where I think that Wasabi developers love me uh, because I come up with all these crazy feature requests uh, that absolutely have to be in the wallets now. <laughs> and I, I think to that already very long list, I'm going to have to add DLCs uh, and Wabi Sabi coordinated coin joints with DLCs. Uh, because, I mean, seriously, that is such a big privacy improvement um, that it is, I think, very much worth to consider just for the privacy-focused wallet, let alone for all the usability aspects and all the cool features that come out of it. 
Well, and and hopefully it encourages more adoption of Wasabi as well. Because, I mean, while, you know, Wasabi is privacy focused, like, I don't think DLCs cut against that mission or maybe even help adoption of uh, Wasabi so that, you know, more people will be using privacy by default uh, with Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, uh, am I correct in saying Wasabi is a C-sharp uh, implementation? Yeah, exactly. Wasabi gotcha. is yeah, so. privacy pay use and Bitcoin. So the work that Nicholas is doing, we will... Yeah, you'll be able to just go steal all of his work. It'll be great. <laughs> He's such a wizard, seriously. Um, very, very important to have him uh, to do all crazy things. Like, he, he ported Lipsec P to C Sharp in like a couple days as if it were nothing. How? <laughs> Yeah, and he also he ported uh, ECDSA adapter signatures, which is what we use for DLCs and C Sharp as well. So that's fun. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, well, to haul that back to the early part of the conversation, that's the beauty of free software, right? Bunch of crazy people coming together to come up with these crazy things, <laughs> uh, but that somehow end up working, uh, and and that really is beautiful to see it all coming together. Well, uh, Chris and Adaf, this this ended up being a, a bit longer uh, than I expected, but hey, every piece of it was golden. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, that I got you here to talk all about these many nuances. Uh, but, but but before I let you go, like, what are what is the, what is the one thing that that you are most excited about when it comes to the current state of the Bitcoin system? Oh, I mean, well, that's very. Tapper, I beat you to it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I for me as you know, somebody I guess I've been in this space for eight years, getting close to a decade at this point, which is scary to say, is like, you know, the the mainstream normalization and adoption of Bitcoin has been very encouraging to see. Um I was really you know, getting through the vilification phases, I don't think we're all the way through those yet. But um for the most part it seems like, you know, other folks that are better at uh, public relations than I am have uh, managed to kind of uh, shift the perception of Bitcoin from the early days of, you know, it being used for, you know, illicit activity to a much more mainstream, um, you know, it's a store of value, it's freedom enhancing, it's, you know, for people that care about privacy, um, you know, I, I, I think that's like one of the most powerful uh, trends that have really come out of the last couple of years. Yeah. And Max can attest to, in 2019, I was walking around at Bitcoin conferences with my Taproot t-shirts, so I'm still very excited about Taproot. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when seeing your t-shirt, it was the very, very first time that I realized what Taproot actually means, um, right? Because it's a Taproot, which is a type of vegetable <laughs> that grows underground with one big root and many smaller roots branching out of that. Right. Yeah, the taproot is the first root that comes out of the seedling before all of the other ones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that just makes sense, right? With taproot, you have a cooperative case, as used most often, and that is the most beautiful case, right? But out of that case, there are an infinite number of, of other branches coming out, uh, of other spending conditions, uh, and, and each of them can be as, as uh, like beautifully nested discrete lock contracts, uh, every single one of them. <laughs> exactly. So, Chris Nadar, hey, again, thanks so much for this conversation. Um, it, uh, like this, this really made me so much more bullish on Bitcoin, uh, which which is not easy to achieve. <laughs> My state of current bullishness already, uh, but it's just incredible what we're building here. And you guys at Shirtbits are rock stars, seriously. Uh, like I'm, I was, I was impressed with your initial, you know, product of of the paid API, but what you're doing with the sweet lock contracts is like infinitely more interesting and more powerful and more disruptive. Uh, so I totally get the pivot that you made, and I think it was a very wise decision. Uh, and, and again, thanks very much for putting all of your work and all of your technology and resources out in the open as, as free and open source. Uh, that just catapults humanity to the very next level. Well, thank you, Max. And, uh, you know, everybody go out, try go out, try it. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. And, uh, you know, we're here to, at the end of the day, you know, make it useful for people to use. And, uh, you know, we want to see adoption of this cool technology as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And if, if listeners are interested in, like, resources to start with, uh, there's uh, the DLC specs repo. That's one word, DLC specs on GitHub. 
uh, and we've got a bunch of resources there and introductory docs as well as the actual specifications and links to the implementations and all the rest of it. And then I think, Chris, we also have some documentation on Bitcoin as well. Yeah, Bitcoin, if you're a technically minded person and you want to go see how to start playing around with the APIs and Bitcoin S, uh, it's just bitcoin-s.org. And you should be able to find resources about uh, our DLC wallet, our DLC Oracle server that powers the application Crystal Bowl that I mentioned earlier. And uh, of course, there's links to our Slack on there. And feel free to join and ask questions. You know, we're help, here to help you guys. Yeah, and on top of that, there's a discrete log contracts Telegram group, as well as uh, we have monthly spec meetings. So if you're interested in being like a fly on the wall, you know, maybe you're you want to build something on top of DLCs and you want to you know, keep your finger on the pulse. We have a, the first Tuesday of every month, there's a specification meeting where uh, I, I go through kind of all of the updates. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much, guys, uh, both of you for coming on here. It's been a blast. Uh, keep on building. I'm, I'm so excited what, you know, what you come up with in the future. Uh, I, I can barely imagine how it can get any better, <laughs> but I'm sure that you will figure it out. Uh, so again, thanks very much for coming on the show and join the Weather Vcast and see you on the next one.